for the Lord. We are glad to have you all here this morning. Glad that you are joining us, whether you are online or you're here in person, we're glad to see you here this morning. We have a couple of announcements before we enter into this time of worship. So we announced it last week. We want to continue announcing it every week uh, and leading up to it so that uh, everyone is aware. So we are at that time of the year where it's time to uh, vote for, approve a new church budget for the next fiscal year. And so the, the copies of the proposed budget are out in the lobby. Uh, they are all over the town out there. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. I, I just want to say that I'm on the budget, and I want to kind of summarize what, what we've done. <clears throat> we may have on the 27th. Thank you. 
Right. 
through here. We have a brand new baby back here that I wish you'd introduce to us, please. Don't fight for your brother's friends. <laughs> You know, I 
look for a miracle in some of the smallest ways. My God might not call us miracles, but to me it was because I'm not very passionate. But Richard and Andrew last week said, hey, we're going to work together on TV. I said, sure, no problem. 11.30, see, maybe I'll be there, I'll see you later. Brown patch. Of course, I've never done brown patch before. I ordered my train on the other side of the house. It's on the phone.
actually wrote this particular account uh, was a guy named Robert Robinson. And when he wrote it, he, he wrote it as a young man and had recently been converted. And there's a line in, in the song that, that always stuck out to me. It's, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel. Prone to leave the God I love. And it's, it's a line that we can all relate to. We all have those days where we just aren't feeling. Those days where we're just, we're feeling the flesh. We're, we, are, we are not walking in the ways of the Spirit as we want to be. And, and Robinson understood that more, better than most because there was a time, even after his conversion, when, when he walked away from the church. He walked, he, he joined another movement, known as the Universalist movement, that, is, that teaches that there's more than one way to God. And, and he believed in that, bought into that, but before his death, he Lord has lost him back. And so the words ring so clearly to us each in, in, in our lives, but even more clearly to you. Because there was a moment where you did want it. There was a moment where you walked away from the gospel that you've been saved by God's grace. And he passed into eternity. He realized that the Lord didn't bind him anymore. He said, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave.
Psalms is a worship book, a worship book. It's filled with praises, but it's filled with great wisdom. So turn with me to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Everybody found it? Hold up your Bible. Let's see. There you go. You can see that. Put yourself before the Word of God before you put yourself before any preacher, any teacher. Always have the Word of God. For you see, our teacher and our preacher is the Holy Spirit of God. And He's the one who teaches us. Now, we come to Psalm 127, and Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 is called one of the Psalms of Ascent. And you say, what, what do you mean, the Psalms of Ascent? You see, there are 15 of these in number, and they corresponded to the, the steps that led from a court of the men up to the temple. And it is said that the Levites, as they stood on each step, they would stop and they would sing one of these Psalms as they ascended up to the Lord. And it is said that it was a constant thing, these songs of ascent, that the pilgrims would sing as they went up to Jerusalem. And so they were sung by those who were on pilgrimage. At certain feast times, such as Passover, they would come up to the hill of the Lord. They would ascend to the hill of the Lord. And we're going to be looking at one of these this morning, or part of it. Now, ten of these songs, and there are fifteen of them, they're anonymous. But five of them, four of them were penned by David. He was a great worship leader. You know, he was a mighty, mighty warrior. He didn't want to stand before David, but he was also a mighty worshiper. David wrote four of these, and then his son Solomon wrote the one that we're going to be looking at today. And the one thing that I want to say about each one of these, and particularly this one today, is this song of ascent is all about worship. It's all about our perspective. How we're going to engage God. How we're going to let him engage us. And so we turn to that psalm today. The purpose of the psalm of ascent is to provide encouragement on the journey. On the journey of life. It's an unbroken song of praise, if you will, for those who are in pilgrimage and on journey with Jesus and with Yahweh. So if you will, stand and let's read Psalm 127. We're not going to read the whole psalm today. In fact, I just want to read two verses because next week I intend to finish the psalm. Next week is extremely important as we look at the remainder of the psalm. But let's read verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in what? Fame. Who builds it? Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in what? Fame. It is what? Vain for you to rise up early to retire late to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Even in his sleep. Now, Father, we come and I ask you to, Lord, break your word to each one of us. Feed us according to the need that is in our heart. Quicken our spirit, correct our spirit, convict our spirit, encourage our spirit. God, I thank you for your word that you preserve. Lord, that we have it to go back to and to recognize that it is as current God as you are. Ever living. And I thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Be seated, please. This morning, I want to preach on beating the daily grind of life. As we approach this later day, I felt like we had a song that I wanted to look at it again. I preached from it and talked from it many, many times as I've taught the book of Psalms preach through many of the songs, and they never get old. But this morning, I will allow us to let this word of God right here address the daily grind in life. And I entitled this message, Laboring with the Lord. Laboring with the Lord. Why? Because it tells us here three times that to be without Him is to do everything to labor in what? Vain. In vain. To labor in vain. And so, one of the things that I want to say is in the very beginning, God loved men, did he not? Is that how white created us? 
He created us because he loved us and he wanted to fellowship and wants to fellowship with us. But also, God, out of his personality of love and care, he gave us a gift. And that gift is work. You say, oh, work. I didn't want that. But you see, we view work differently because now we see it after the end of sin. And so it is vain and it is grinding many times in our lives. But God never intended that, and it doesn't have to be that way today. He intends for us to live life and see work as a gift from Him. Now, you know what I know, that our nation doesn't see it that way anymore. Very few people see it that way anymore. And some days I don't see it that way. Some days you don't see it that, that, that way. Sometimes it just kind of grinds us down, grinds us down. And that's why so many of us spend our lives doing things that if we're honest at the end of the day, in the midst of midnight, when we're looking through the mirror, we do not enjoy doing what we've done that day. And so we talk about things like the daily grind. We talk about from nine to five. We talk about another day, another dollar. Why do we do that? You see, when we consider life that way, and when we're thinking that way, we naturally begin to wonder why. It's useless. Everything is vanity. There's no need in living like this, but I don't have a choice. Well, we do have a choice. And so that's why I want us to look at this song, at these two verses. What is the goal of this song? What is it that God is intending to teach us? He's telling us, listen, I want you to have a proper perspective when it comes to work. I want you to have a proper perspective when it comes to work. You see, this song is talking about this very thing. Have anybody ever knew the daily grind? Even after having everything, it was solid. Go back and read the book of Ecclesiastes if you think he didn't understand that. Solomon was always fighting with it. He finally came to the point of being mature enough in his life after wasting many, many years to understand. I didn't have to live life this way. Everything I've done up, up to this point has really been futile. It hasn't accomplished anything. All it has done is just simply grind me down. And that's what this song is talking about. And Solomon, the author here, you see, this is the one song that we know that he wrote for sure. It's talking about the daily grind. It's talking about life being lived in futility. I've got to get up again today and go make another dollar. That's the way we put it so many times, by going to work. But let's read these verses again. And see what it has to say about work. It says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor or those who work, they do it in vain. And they're building something that's not going to accomplish anything. Not the purpose of God. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keep awake in vain. It is vain, useless, futile for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. For he gives his beloved, even in his sleep, even in his sleep, God is going to provide for us. And so we need to get out from under the daily grind. It doesn't mean that we don't have to work. We do. You see, work satisfies us. When we're doing something that we like to do, and we can't be picky or choosy, but that means working out of the giftedness that God has given us. He intends for us not just to be preachers or teachers or deacons. That's not what I'm talking about. God's called every one of us to work inside of our giftedness and to use it, to discover it and to use it daily. Now, when we do that, the daily grind begins to be broken. And so the goal of this song is to show us two things. And I'm going to talk about one of these next week. And I really encourage you to come back and bring somebody with you. It's so important that we look into the song and see what God has to say about the grind or the work, the effort that's put in the family. And that's what we look at in verses 3 through 5. But today, we want to look at work from God's perspective. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I remember the boy. And it says of the preacher, they gave him 20 minutes and he finished up at 10. He was a prince of a fellow. I think I would have seen him again. But guess what? You know I'm not a prince of a fellow. I believe that the word of God takes time. But I just want to look at these two verses this morning because it has so much to say to us. The psalm is talking about two things. Look at it in this verse. In verse 1, it's talking about watching. Talking about watching. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman 
Will you stay awake? We keep awake in vain. Well, I've got to guard this. I've got to make sure I do that. I've got to take care of everything. I've got to have it under my control. The Bible says that does nothing more than grind us down. The Bible says that our God loves us and He's provided for us those who are walking with Him, even when we fall asleep. Another gift from God. And also, it's not only that. Look at what it says in verse three, talking about holding. We'll talk about this next week. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. We're talking about watching. So that means we have to pay attention. It's talking about beholding. It's talking about seeing things that we've never seen before. It's understanding what we've never understood before. We're moving deeper in that understanding. So we're to watch. We're to behold. And this psalm serves as a watchman for our lives. It is a watchman in our lives. And it tells us something. You see, it's a watchman that gives the law when life is threatened. And life is threatened whenever we think that it's futile, whenever we think that life is just vanity. Our life really is threatened. It may not be threatened physically, but it is threatened mentally, and it is threatened spiritually. And it matters how we look at things. And so the daily life that we call work can be a frustration. It can be just a little more than a daily drive. But from the perspective of this song, there's a chance and there's an opportunity and there's a real possibility that we'll no longer have to live in vain as we begin to change our perspective. Now, whether that frustration is coming at you from a difficult boss or from difficult employees or maybe an inflexible parent or maybe a rebellious teenager, we still have a means if we watch ourselves to overcome that. You see, Sometimes we get in a grind where there's not enough work and we worry and worry. Or there's too much work and we don't know what to do. But this song gives us a brand new perspective on that matter. A new perspective of factory work, of making payroll, of policy, of uh, politics, of policing a city, of pastoring a church. You say, pastoring a church, well, you pastors got a name. Well, I should report the same thing that you do day to day. So the song is about builders building. It's about laborers laboring. It's about guarding ourselves. It's about rising early and working late, verse 2 says. What we would call burning the candle at both ends in the morning. It's about couples with young children not being able to remember when they had a last good night's sleep. They just don't even remember that. And you understand that if you've been a parent or are a parent now. If it hasn't happened, it is going to be right now. I just ask you to trust me on that. But God will provide the energy that you need. And our perspective is extremely important. You see, it's about farmers, if you will. When I grew up on a farm, I pastored farming churches. Farmers work hard. Their written off is to deliver people. I'm going to tell you something. Being a farmer is a difficult business. You have to be, if you're going to survive in the farming business, you have to be a very astute businessman and you have to know what you're doing. But it also requires working from dawn to dusk to bring in a harvest. Shift work. Maybe you're old, maybe you're working two jobs. The stuff of life, the daily grind. That's what we're talking about. How do you beat the daily grind in life? You beat it with the proper perspective. The perspective that the song offers to us. Now is perspective is our perspective important? Is it? Our perspective is everything. It's very important. I want to share with you this letter that a college student wrote to her parents. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry to be so long in writing. Unfortunately, all of my stationery was destroyed the night our dormitory was set on fire by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now when the doctors say my eyesight should return sooner or later. The wonderful boy Bill who rescued me from the fire kindly offered to share his little apartment with me until I dorm and rebuild. He comes from a good family, so you won't be surprised when I tell you that we're going to be married. In fact, since I know you've always both wanted a grandchild, you'll be glad to know that your grand will be grandparents in just several months. It won't be long. Signed. Your loving mother. B.S. 
please disregard the above practice in this composition. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not expecting. I don't even have a steady water bed, but I did get it in the French and it had been chemistry. And I just wanted to be sure that you received this news in a proper way. <laughs> we understand that, don't we? What that says to us is things could be a lot worse. They really could. They could be a lot worse than you can watch our perspective. Now, you may say that the way we look at things, the way that I look at things, or the way that you look at things, really doesn't change things. But that's not what has to change. What has to change is our perspective, how we feel about those things, and the attitude that we have as we approach these things. And we have to change the way that we think, and that will change the way that we live. And life will take on a fresh new meaning for us, much more than we ever thought it could. We thought those days were gone, but they're not. God's saying you can have those any day. Just change your perspective. And this psalm is a picture of reality. That's what it is. It is a picture of reality. And it's asking us to watch and to behold life in this manner. Seeing life through the eyes of God. Seeing life through his perspective. Seeing life through his promise. Seeing life through his provision. That's the way not to live in vain. He's going to provide for us. He's promised that. Our God has never broken a promise. He's never let one fall through his fingers and break on the floor. He keeps his promises and he gives to his beloved even in their sleep. Those who love God, the Bible says he provides. He provides. And so we have to see work as God sees it, as he wants us to see it. And we beat the daily grind that way. This perspective on work is very encouraging, or it is to me, to adopt uh, this psalm as truth. Let me show something to you. I want to show you that it's built on a conditional perspective. Look at the first two verses again. The first two verses have a conditional clause to them. What does that mean? It's hardwired into the instruction. What it really says is written this way. Unless this takes place, that will never take place. Unless this takes place, that will never take place. It will never happen. The Bible says what in verse 1? Unless the Lord builds the house, and unless he introduces the condition that you and I have to pay attention to. Unless God is building the house, yes, I'm going to do my part, but it doesn't all depend upon me, God. I know that really, in reality, everything depends upon you. My ability to work, my chance to work, everything hinges upon you. The Bible says very simply here, unless the Lord builds the house. What is the consequence? Here's the consequence. The condition is, if God doesn't build the house, we will spend our time laboring in vain. Everything, every day will speak to it. I've got to go back and do it all again. It doesn't matter. But yet, you know, well, I've got to teach myself. Why? Is our God not going to keep his promises? You see, most people believe that effective work is conditioned upon their ability, the right plan, their activity, and they leave God out of the equation. But it's not. You see, it hinges upon God's activity. They think if I don't do A, B, and C to get it in the proper order, guess what? Then I'll fail. But if I do that, I'll flourish. So I've got to do A, B, and C every time. And unless I get the perfect technique going here and wow people, I'll be living in vain. Everything will be bad. But the Bible says, no, no. Here's the condition. Unless the Lord builds a house. Now I want you to know that that house is me. And that house is you. Unless God is building this house and your house, it doesn't matter. We're going to be laboring in vain. That's why it's important to feed on the Word of God and to grow in the Word of God because He then builds this house and it's not in vain. Now, the psalm tells us that there's no need in working hard unless we're depending upon God. It doesn't say don't work hard. There's nothing wrong in time for working from sunup to sundown. God expects us to work and He's given to us as a gift. But it doesn't hinge everything upon us. You see, ineffectiveness 
is a result of worry. We won't be effective if we don't worry about things. Not only that, we have to have the right perspective, and that is place ourselves in the hands of a God who never fails us. Unless the Lord, unless the Lord builds a house, we will be doing everything. We'll be eating what? We'll be eating the bread of anxious toil, is what verse 2 says. It is vain for you to rise up early to retire late. To eat the bread of painful, which means anxious, worrisome toil, for he gives his beloved even in his sleep. And that word labor there is the word toil. And when you go back to, to Genesis, God talks about Adam and the punishment of sin upon Adam. That he no longer will just, he'll earn bread by the work of his brow. It means the toil, toil. And it means literally a breaking down to the point of death. God saying, I give you life. I don't intend you to live that way. For life to break you down to where life has no meaning at all and it calls you to die early. That's not my intention for you, is what God is saying. Now look in verse 2, if you will. For he gives beloved, or he gives to his beloved, even in his sleep. Do you know what? That word is the signature of Solomon. That word beloved, you see, it is God's name that he gave to. Solomon. He gave him the name Jedediah. Jedediah means beloved of the Lord. That's what it means. And this is Solomon's way of inserting himself in this song and letting us know I know this personally. This is wisdom that I'm giving you. Now that's something that we'll stop and consider. The wisest man who ever lived is not all of these scientists that we see today. The wisest man who ever lived outside of God man Jesus of Solomon. And so his word is important to us as well. And he wrote the song when he was older. He was back on life and saw much of my time was spent in vanity in his name. And he signed it with his name. So what I want to say to you for you today is to be full. To be fulfilled. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain to do it. 
unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain that the wise are burdened to retire away, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. A proper perspective, it is everything. I've used the illustration before, but it's so powerful. I've used it several times, many times throughout my preaching ministry. Because it struck me when I heard it. You know, many times in my life, when I think about it, when I'm facing the daily grind, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the lady who was named Elizabeth Elliott, the wife of Jim Elliott, a missionary who was killed by the Gulf of Indians in South America. The one who said, Lord, I don't pray for a long life, I just pray for a black life. Set his sticks on fire. God really loved him. When he died, she said, My world collapsed. She said, I was getting over and dealing with the grief as best I could, but I still could hardly function. She said, I had a friend of mine who called me from California and wanted to meet Tom and be with her because her husband had died. I thought, I don't have anything to give. I have no energy. She said, But I, I knew I had to. She said, I boarded the plane, and I sat by the window. And she said, after we were up in the air, she said, I looked out of the window to her right, and she said, the clouds were blowing everywhere, and they were dark, and lightning was flashing, and you could feel the wind shudder the plane. And she said, I was afraid, and I looked out the other window on the other side, and she said, then I saw it. the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen in my life. And she said, God said, you pick between me and God. I'll make you look at it. And so it was our perspective. And it matters. And let's let God say, whether we choose one ourselves, that directs us and breaks us on the day we want. Father, I come today and I thank you for the Lord's church. I ask God for those who may not know you to say, Lord, Life's around the now, and nothing's has to be just to do. God, I pray that you find the fulfillment of the only thing possible, and that is through your son, Jesus, the one who came and died for us willingly on the cross to pay the price for sin, to give us a brand new life, so we can be born again and belong to God and who would love to be Lord. Father, I pray for us as believers. We know we're beloved of you, Lord. God, we we'll love you right. It's proper that our feelings will change. And too often we toil under the daily grind. And I ask today, God, today, change our perspective. And I come and ask God that our lives would be you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may need to come to the altar today and say, God, change your perspective. You change your life. Jesus, and guess what? He can change your perspective this very day. He can do that, and he will do that, if that's what you ask him to do. And it may be that you're here and you say, you know, I've sat here for many years, and that you may be in the same place that I'm sitting today. I've heard the word of God, and I've heard the invitation, and I've felt the Spirit draw me home before, but I've never broke down and laid my pride aside and said, God, life's just beautiful without you. Thank you for allowing me to live long enough to know that. Today I come and I say, God, I would like to be close to you. I receive you by faith. Don't understand it all, but I receive you by faith and I accept your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for forgiving me of my sin, and you walk out of here, God, with a new understanding. Thank you.